Welcome to the Atheist in Recovery podcast, where we talk about finding hope in recovery. And now your host, Dr. Adina Silvestri. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode nine of the Atheists in Recovery podcast. Today's guest is Chris Marshall of the Booze List Bar, known as Sands Bar in Austin, Texas. And today's interview was really, it was a, it was a real joy. Um, I find working in the addiction field that there are very few resources for people who are are deciding to quit drinking or um, or are coming out of a of a rehab facility and trying to connect with with other people uh, and find community that doesn't involve AA or maybe that is a supplement to AA. And so I'm hoping that you will find some comfort in knowing that there are other options out there, um, as with Stan's Bar. On to my guest. Today's guest's mission is to create a safe and inviting atmosphere for people who want to have a good time without alcohol. On his website, Chris Marshall says we offer live music, a vibrant upscale environment, and sober drinks that you won't find anywhere else. From happy hour to last call, Sandspar will offer a safe, sober space to make authentic conversations with people just like you. What we strive to create is the environment which will inspire our guests to engage in sober fun and to become the best version of themselves. Chris states that he has been sober since February of 2007, and Sandspar is the perfect combination of his passion for celebrating life and work experience in both counseling and hospitality. The inspiration from Sands Bar comes from Chris's work as a counselor. Time and time again, clients shared with him the struggle of finding a place to go that is fun and energetic, but safe for those who want to have a great night without alcohol. Chris was saddened by the loss of so many celebrities, friends, and family members who felt like there was no place for them to turn. Chris works tirelessly in memory of those wonderful people who are no longer here to experience an abundant life. Okay, here we go. Chris, welcome to the show. Hi. Hi. So I thought we could start our conversation by inquiring about your spiritual background. And let's go all the way back. Let's go from childhood. And then we'll. Talk about how that's influenced your recovery. Yeah, so um, I grew up um, in a traditionally Southern Baptist home. Um, that was, I mean, the foundation of my my existence. I think um, uh, my family, my mom's family, comes from a you know just a you know kind of a, a lineage of uh, kind of preachers and musicians in church. And so, uh, I grew up, uh, pretty, pretty much Southern Baptist. Um, you know, that was just my, my world, you know, very early on in life. And, uh, uh, it was, you know, very helpful, I guess, in in establishing some framework of uh, a belief system. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think that what, I got very early on was an, an understanding of, you know, this, this idea that I'm, I'm more than just me. I'm more than just, um, you know, the sum of just this individual self. Like I'm connected to something greater. I'm connected to, uh, the people around me. And, uh, that is something that, uh, I think is just, I think that that's part of now that's part of just the way I see myself, right? I don't see myself as just an individual, I see myself as a part of a collective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Okay, so you created a bar in Austin, Texas that is is boozeless, and I want to get there. Um, Maybe you could talk a little bit about your recovery journey. 
and because that influenced, I assume, everything else. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and then that early upbringing, I think, also influenced that. And I, I probably will try to weave a little bit of uh, that into the story as well, because um, I think that's just a cornerstone of of the story, of uh, understanding that um, mm-hmm. I'm not just an individual, that I belong to a, a larger um, organism, you know, the human organism. I think that um, that is just very central to what Sam's Bar is. So, yeah, so start at the beginning uh, of my of my, my life, my story. I suppose I can give you like a five-minute version. I was basically uh, <laughs> born in, uh, in the early 80s and uh, to two parents. Um, my dad was a, a kind of UPS worker and also was an amateur boxer and my mom teacher and they had a great life we had a great house Um, my sister was born uh, two years after I was born and it was a quintessential uh, American family minus the dog Um, (laughs) then uh, when I was five years old my dad uh, started to exhibit symptoms of schizophrenia Um, we now also think that that might have also been some traumatic brain injury due to boxing Um, and that upended that ideal picturesque family. And uh, that really shaped the rest of my life. Um, so my father got sick, my parents divorced. Um, I was, you know, I just had this immense sense of like responsibility for um, my my dad's illness. I felt that I literally caused it and I you know it's it's very common for kids to think that they caused a divorce um well you couple that with a mental illness you feel like you broke your dad um at five years old like that's the rationale you broke your dad and then um you know it's your fault so um I uh I really struggled uh to have my own identity and to have uh to find my place in the world um, I was often the class clown. Um, I was often just, I think I was just seeking attention. I was seeking, seeking connection with people. Um, I felt so disconnected to people uh, most of my life. I was always different in some way. Um, you know, I was the only kid who had divorced parents, or I was the only one that, you know, didn't have the same amount of money as my peers. Or, you know, in some situations, I was. Uh, you know, in third grade, my sister and I went to a school and it was all white kids. It was just me and my sister were the only black kids. And it was like that just, it just, it just further solidified the feeling that I was not like everyone else. And I was always different. And um, Mm -hmm. that continued on to high school. So, you know, high school was interesting because I Again, felt so different than everyone else. And eventually, I uh, found alcohol. And I'll never forget the first time I had a drink. I was 16 years old. It was a hot, hot, hot summer day in Texas. And uh, there had been beer sitting in someone's uh, trunk all day long. And uh, the first drink I had was this hot, disgusting beer. And... uh, I remember my body literally shaking, like, ugh, it was so gross. I just, ugh, I, you know, even now I can just remember just how gross I remember it being. But I also remember mm-hmm. feeling so connected to the guys that I was drinking with and I had that experience with. In fact, you know, my faith, you know, was part of the reason why I, I had not had a drink until then. I had decided that, you know what, I'm not going to have sex do drugs or drink alcohol until I'm 18 years old. But the pull of being part of a community was so great that I couldn't pass up the opportunity. I didn't want to miss this important rite of passage. And so uh, I took that first drink. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the pull was that great. You just wanted to belong, right? Yeah. And then that started the journey with alcohol? Yeah. Yeah. to me, alcohol was a great equalizer. Um, you know, I was a middle middle class kid in a, a neighborhood of or in a suburb of Houston that was mostly up lower, lower middle lower upper class. 
Uh, and that's a small distinction, but when you're, you know, when you already feel different than everyone else, and you are, you already feel disconnected from the world. Um, that was a great divide. And I just always felt like I just didn't match up to my friends. They were going on amazing trips and doing amazing things. And they already had these amazing careers picked out. And I just was floating through life. Um, the second time I ever drank in my life, ever, I crashed my mom's car. I got a DUI at 16. Um, that was the first time I went to jail. Like there was just, I did not handle alcohol well. I never did. I never, um, I can recall very few nights where I just had a few and that was it. From the second I drank, um, it was abnormal. And I'm really grateful for that now because I understand that that accelerated the demise. And that acceleration is what got me sober at 23. <clears throat> Excuse me. But your story doesn't end there. Um... You went into a very familiar profession, um, <laughs> counseling. Yeah. So, you know, that happened as a result of, again, uh, you know, I, I got, you know, to, to a, you know, what I would call a place of um, unmanageability, a place where I just could not keep drinking anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got sober in rehab for the last time. And, uh, you know, I had no real direction, you know, for the first 18 months of my sobriety, um, I was still very, very shaky. I was shaking. I was, uh, just very anxious. Mm -hmm. I didn't really have any direction in life once again. And, um, I went to the local community college here in Austin, you know, took an aptitude test and they said, well, you know, here are the things that you're, you score really high on. And none of them paid very well at all. Um, <laughs> they were all like very low paying service jobs. And uh, I was like, hmm, the only ones that kind of, you know, speak to me are like kind of social work or counseling. And so I decided to go in school, back to school, become a counselor. And then I, I started doing that uh, here in Austin. And uh, it was, I think it was everything that I was looking for. Um, I felt that I had purpose mm -hmm. and I felt that once again, I, I was, I was reconnected to society in the way that I always wanted to be. And I felt like I was, um, I had purpose, I had a mission. And, uh, I think that was just so integral to me staying sober long-term was understanding that, um, that my life mattered and what I did mattered. And, and I was really, really good at just connecting to people because I understood what it's like to feel disconnected from the rest of the world. Right. Yeah. You had this lived experience that you could impart on people. Absolutely. Not only through, you know, substance use, but also through uh, mental health because part of what happened and I, and I do believe that it was probably, um, you know, always there. I was always an anxious kid, but I think um, through my alcoholism, um, I, had a series of traumatic events and I had a, a series of things that just opened up the doors of anxiety and depression. And um, to be a professional with anxiety and depression um, was a gift, is a gift. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I don't wish mental health disorders on anyone, but um, I am grateful for the fact that I, that I still live with these things. Um, because I believe it shapes the way that I see the world. And it um, it gives me a sense of, um, I don't want to use the, overuse the word connection, but I, it just, that's the word that comes up for me. It's like, I feel like uh, when people say, I'm so depressed, you don't understand. I can say, I do. I absolutely do. I know what it's like to not want to get out of bed. I know what it's like to think everyone's looking at you or talking about you. I know what it's like to uh, feel like you're an imposter. Um, those are not theories that I've read in a book. Those are things that I've lived with and, and live with um, on a daily basis. And so um, being a professional and working in mental health and substance abuse, um, you know, for eight years has been an amazing thing for me. But at the same time, while it was fulfilling, 
there was still this piece that just did not feel complete. Um, you know, uh, I think I did important work. Um, I believe that I was part of a team that helped change lives, but I often felt that what we were doing was inadequate next to the problem that people were facing. Mm -hmm. So I was introduced to you through through a couple magazine articles, <laughs> but I'm going to reference the NPR article that you were in. And I quote, um, as an industry, we have become skilled in getting people to recovery, but we suck at keeping them there. Can you talk more about that? <laughs> That's a great quote. <laughs> I, forgot, I forgot I said that. Um, you know, good for NPR for keeping that in there. Because, you know, I, I say a lot of things and sometimes people only pick and choose like the parts that sound uh, germane to the narrative. And uh, that, is, that is my singular um, kind of framework for Sandsbar. Um, so as a professional, I was working in, you know, these, I worked in detox, I worked in outpatient, I worked in residential. And, you know, I, I guess what I've learned is that I have a knack for seeing systems and like evaluating systems and, and kind of like understanding what systems work and what systems, what within a system doesn't work as well. I'm just very good at kind of diagnosing um, like that. I don't even know what you call that, but that's just like, I'm learning like that is, that is what my real uh, gift or my, my, you know, the thing that I, I'm good at, I, I'm good at seeing. So I was, I was, you know, in this giant, you know, industry that is um, so good at doing one thing. And that one thing is while people are um, in the system, they can perform very, very well. They make real, real substantive change. Like it's actual change. But when you leave that system, um, people don't maintain the change. And it's like, it's like going to a hospital, um, having surgery, and then as soon as you walk out of the hospital, your body reverts back to what it was. And if, um, if medicine, if, you know, if medicine had that kind of track record, uh, there wouldn't be, <laughs> there wouldn't be doctors, right? People just would not go to hospitals because that doesn't work long term. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've seen this happen, this pattern happen over and over again. And as a professional, I have continued to lose people. That I was working with, I continued to lose um, friends um, to addiction, and uh, I just felt that what we were offering was woefully inadequate because I know that the problem that that people are facing um, persists beyond the hours of eight a.m. to five p.m. on a weekday. Like that's not where the struggle is. The struggle isn't during office hours. The struggle is at nine o'clock at night on a Friday when you're twenty-five and looking for something to do. Um, we don't work with people to create a community that they can plug into and stay in for the rest of their lives. We don't do that. You know, it's almost as if the, the treatment industry is more concerned about recidivism than it is repair. And I, I don't believe that that's the case. I just think that that's been acceptable for far too long. And so uh, Sandsbar is my answer to that. Sandsbar is a way to create community um, and not just for people who are struggling with alcoholism. Um, I also find that a lot of people come to Sandsbar because they want to belong to a community of people that actually listen to them and actually care about them. And how do you create this environment? Tell us about that. So, so yeah, so. Part of what informs my um, my environmental engineering <laughs> is this um, this real you know lived you know experience of someone that has anxiety and depression, um, and I know that when I go into social situations, some things can be overwhelming to me. Um, you know, I I definitely realize that when I'm in, a, in an environment that is new and there's a lot of like 
and three stuff going on, that elevates my anxiety. So, you know, if you walk in the Sands Bar on a Friday night, um, it is packed. It is bustling. But you'll notice some things are a little different than other bars. Um, one thing that you'll notice is that the music is never louder than a conversational tone. Um, you can always maintain a conversation uh, at Sands Bar because we believe that the real product is not the drinks, even though they are amazing. I think I do a good job creating drinks. Um, not the entertainment, although the entertainment is pretty incredible. The real product of Sands Bar is the connection, is the community that we're creating. And um, I don't want anything to get in the way of that. So um, everything that we do, you know, even if it's like, you know, comedy night and, you know, you're listening to someone do comedy, we, we create space for people to have connections. We take breaks so that people can talk about the jokes that they heard. You know, we, we do all of these things so that people have an understanding that this is a place where you can come in and have a uh, real, real connection with other people. Um, you know, our bartenders and bar staff are all trained uh, either formally or informally in mental health first aid. So that when someone comes in and they're struggling with mental health stuff, um, we can just, you know, do some brief intervention. But most importantly, we can, you know, refer them to people. We have resources at the ready. So if someone's like, man, I'm just really struggling. I didn't know where to go. Like, okay, let's get you a drink. But then let's look at, you know, maybe let's refer you to somebody that can maybe help you, you know, in a way that we're just not equipped to because that's not our scope of practice. That is so interesting. It's like a triage for people that need help, don't know where to go. Right. It, but in a very fun context. And I think that, um, that that's, 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 that's a balance that's, that I really want to strike. Um, it is, you know, it is this person that, that created this thing with this clinical kind of background, but it is intentionally fun because I believe that that is, again, another thing I never saw in any, any discharge plan was fun, you know, and I believe that in order to stay sober long term, every individual must find a life worth staying sober for. You are not going to stay sober if your life is worse or the same as when you were drinking or using. It's just, it makes no sense, right? If I were to uh, say I want to lose weight and work out and I start, you know, eating a bunch of kale and, you know, working out six days a week and I continue to gain weight, I'm not going to continue those changes because it's ultimately not as rewarding as what I was doing. You know, and I'm going to go back to eating, you know, cheeseburger and fries because at least with that, I get and if I get, you know, what I want. And so we have to offer people that opportunity. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I hear that so often, um, you know, my life wasn't a life worth saving. And then maybe they find a best friend or a cousin or someone else that was struggling. And then that kind of pulls them along, but you're offering a completely different alternative. And I feel like in a society where more and more people are isolated, I mean, I don't know if, if you've heard the epidemic of isolation theory. Um, mm -hmm, I just find mm -hmm. that so refreshing. Yeah, I mean, we, we, see, we see it. Um, we see that isolation manifested in so many ways in Western society. We see um, suicide rates uh, increasing. We see um, mass shootings at, at an unthinkable pace in, this, in, this, in the United States. We see so many of these little... Um, symptoms, right? But we never look at the, the real problem. The real problem is this isolation. And so um, that is what I, I really start every night with uh, at Sands Bar. I, I take a second um, before I open and I remember why I'm doing this. And I'm doing this not because it's a cool concept, not because it's trendy right now, or not because I've had a lot of press, um, although I'm grateful for that. I do it because maybe there's somebody that is just lonely and doesn't know where else to go. And they don't want to see that they're lonely. They don't want to see that they feel alone. They, they don't want to say that um, they feel like their life doesn't matter. And this is a great way to come 
and you're included. You're part of the party. You're part of the conversation. Um, I have a no wallflowers policy. You know, um, I will allow you to come in and just kind of check it out, but I, I don't let someone just come in and not acknowledge them or just let them sit in the corner. If you, if we talk and you're like, I'd rather just be quiet and sit in the corner. I totally respect that because that is, that's an intention, right? Like I want to, that, that's what I want to do for the night and that's fine. Right. But no one comes in with without a greeting, without a, Hey, how are you? Without checking in and just saying like, are you doing okay? How was your week? Um, all of those things matter to me. When I go to other bars, um, I don't see that happening. I see, you know, you order, you stand in line, you get your drink, and you go find a seat, you know, and the bartender could care less because the bartender's concerned about, you know, the money. And I'm, I just believe if you, if you put purpose over profit, um, you'll always have all the money you need in the world. Mm-hmm. Love that. Right. How do you combat this social anxiety piece? People, like we had said earlier, use alcohol as a means to connect. How, how do you how do you work around that when they come to Sandspar? Yeah. So a few things. Um, the first thing again is the environment. Um, it feels very kind of cozy. People kind of call it like it feels like someone's um, like you know like a lounge space. Like it's, it's some place. It's some place to kind of just like hang out. There's no. It's you know it's not like high art and like hard edges like it doesn't feel that way it feels very very soft um you know i don't have like big huge stage lights i have like soft christmas lights you know like all those things are just kind of like it's it's glowy it's not you know just this hard like in your face abrasive stuff um but then also i think um every week we do a theme and that to me um, there was a couple of challenges in opening a sober bar because people um, have tried to start sober bars around the country uh, for the for the past decade, and um, you know most of them did not succeed. And um, and and I believe that one reason that they didn't succeed. I mean, there's a financial piece which I'm I'm glad to talk about, but there's there's the actual what they offered piece, and what they what I think a lot of people banked on was that you could serve, you know mocktails or alcohol-free beverages and people would just come and they would just stay because there was just this place and I don't think that that's necessarily the way that it works I think that alcohol uh, provides people its own entertainment like you can sit you can sit in the same spot drink when for most normal normal people um, the night gets more interesting just by virtue of you sitting still and drinking. Um, so if you take that out, you have to replace it with something, like I said earlier, like you're, it has to be more exciting and entertaining. And so the programming that we offer uh, with these themed nights gives people an opportunity to have something to look forward to. So karaoke is a, good, is a big you know, thing that we do. We do this uh, series called Movers, Shakers, and Changemakers, where we have um four people come on stage and give like a ted style talk about their lives um and people just i mean it's packed i think uh we did it we did it last friday and we had over 70 people um come throughout the night i mean it was so packed that people were having to take turns coming in because we were we were maxed out i mean it was it's amazing people are hungry to hear other people's stories People are hungry for um, to be part of something, and um, and if AA and the twelve steps are not your 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 means of connection, um, maybe Sands Bar can be. And even if it is, you know, even if the twelve steps do work for you and they do provide community, this is a great supplement to that right. because it gives you a whole other group of people. Um, and I, and I, I, you know, got sober to the 12 steps and I love my 12 step family, but at the same time, I also need to get outside of that sometimes. And I need to get uncomfortable sometimes. I need to meet people who, um, we don't talk about, you know, 12 step stuff. We talk about, you know, just life. We talk about sports. We talk about 
what's going on in the world. Like those things are important as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. Well, we're nearing the end of our time uh, together, but I thought maybe I could end with one last question. If you could write a phrase on a billboard for all to see, what would it say? Hmm. That's a great question, by the way. Um, Man. Yeah, this has been a tough two weeks for me. Um, You know, in the past two weeks, um, I lost my biological father, passed away. And then uh, this past Sunday, my uncle, uh, who was as much of a father to me uh, as my own biological father, passed away suddenly. Um, Thank you. Um, And this has just been a very hard couple of days. Um, And the community that I helped to create at Sands Bar um, has just just swallowed me in love and empathy and um, just condolences. And I never thought when I started this in 2017 that the community that I wanted to create would lift me up, would um, would strengthen strengthen me in this moment. And uh, if I had to, you know, put a uh, put a message on a billboard, it would be that you're not alone. Um, because in this time, um, my my anxiety wants me to feel like. Uh, this will never end. And my depression wants me to feel like um, this is the worst possible thing that could happen to you. Um, the community that I've found at Sands Bar, the friends, dear friends that I've made at Sands Bar, have reminded me that I'm not alone and that um, every problem has an expiration date, that nothing lasts forever. And um, that's what I put on the billboard. You are not alone. Wow. Thank you for that, Chris. Okay. So how can people best find you and the work that you're doing, the amazing work that you're doing? And when are you coming to Virginia? (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, um, so the closest I'll get this year is going to be a return to DC. Um, We were in DC in May for Sam's Bar DC. And um, we just had such a great response in the D.C. area that we have to come back this year. So um, in October, I will be returning to D.C. Um, But we're looking for new places to go next year on this tour. I don't think I even mentioned that, but we're on a nine city tour this year. Um, I'll be in L.A. September 28th. um, And you can find more about that on my Instagram sands underscore bar or about LA at sands bar LA or sands bar DC on Instagram at sands bar DC. Um, uh, You know, those are all great means to find me. I'm on Facebook sands bar. uh, And uh, yeah, the the website is the sands bar.com. Yeah. I, when I, when I say that I really appreciate people sending me emails and questions, conversations through Instagram or, you know, email or, calling me i i mean it i am i answer pretty much every call that i can and uh, respond to every message that i can because um i think what we're on the journey that we're on is one of uh is of growth and i feel like in 10 years time there will be a sands bar in every single major city in the world i I believe that cheers to that and i really really appreciate you coming on thank you so much Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Atheists in Recovery podcast. For more great info and to stay up to date, head over to atheistsinrecovery.com.